She is the co-author of What Color Is Your Parachute? and What Color Is Your Parachute for College? She developed the Wise Wanderings Career Coaching System for Liberal Arts Students that is presented in her book, You Majored in What? Designing Your Path from College to Career. She has twice been listed as one of the 10 most visionary leaders in career services by CSO Research and received the Kaufman Award from the National Association of College, College, Colleges, excuse me, and Employers, NACE, for her service to her profession. Her free downloadable book, Picture Your Career, received the NACE Chevron Award for Outstanding Achievement in Innovative Programming. Kate has written numerous articles that have been published in prominent news media. A board certified counselor and coach, Kate has earned a doctorate in educational psychology with an emphasis in college psychology and a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling from West Virginia University. Her bachelor's degree is in sociology and anthropology from Gettysburg College. Please help me welcome Kate Brooks. That's an so much, Ashley, for that introduction. Special thank you to Jen Bradley for her tireless work with our class this year to help get this all set up. And uh, I have reminded myself now, being back at Mercersburg, why I always had bad hair in every photograph. Uh, the humidity in this town is just stunning. Um, <laughs> And I, and I should warn you, fortunately, I do not have COVID, but I do have allergies and a little bit of laryngitis, so I will just do my best to get through here. Uh, this is an amazingly ambitious title, and I'm not quite sure who came up with it. I don't know, Jen, if you did or I did or where it came from. I won't blame anybody. Uh, but um, I'm, I'll do my best, at the very least, to give you some pointers and some ideas. And I know that everyone is in different stages right now, where you are in your careers and life planning and all that. So I'm hopeful that you will use your imagination to adapt things as, as I say them to, that might work for you. Um, so a little bit first about my history at Mercersburg, and I was not on the 1948 football team, but um, my, my father was a, a chaplain in the Navy during World War II. He was on, served on two hospital ships in the Pacific. And his first calling uh, to a church after he came back from the Pacific was to St. John's Lutheran here in Mercersburg. And uh, he immediately connected with the academy folks, and because he loved football and played football as a, as a high school and college student, uh, somehow he, he ended up being an assistant coach. And he's the, in the front row, the very far on the right person there in the suit, not in the football outfit. Uh, but his, so he left Mercersburg, I believe, in the early 50s, again, before I was even around. But he ultimately was a professor at the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Gettysburg, which is where I grew up. And uh, we came back to Mercersburg every single year from, from the time I can remember till I was 18 or so, because he would come back to chapel once a year to preach. So uh, that's how I got to know Mercersburg. And so when they opened up to girls uh, in my senior year, uh, I got an invitation from Ernie Staley to come over. And uh, I am so glad I did have made some amazing friends as a result. So, okay, back to this title, The Secret to a Lifetime of Meaningful Work. Well, I go to a lot of writers conferences and there's always an undercurrent at the workshops because as much as people want to write, what they really want is to be published. And so at every writer's conference, that's always the question, how can I get published? And I was at a conference on creative nonfiction at Goucher College one summer, and they had a panel called The Secret to Getting Published, and it was standing room only. And we got in there, and Lee Gutkin, who was the presenter, said, there is no secret, and we're not going to teach it to you. So I think writing advice sometimes parallels career advice. There is no secret here to career meaning or success, and I'm not going to teach it to you. But I am hoping that some of the guidance, some of the, the information I provide in the next uh, time period will um, allow you to sort of rethink where you are right now. We're all in such a weird moment in our careers because of COVID. You know, many of us stopped out. Some people uh, ended up losing their jobs. Some people switched to a different job or you're, you know, you're commuting from home. And so it, it might be a completely different world or search for you now. And those of you who are getting close to or entering retirement, again, whole nother search. So 
hopefully these things will be helpful. Let me start with the basis for my thinking about careers. I really default to chaos theory. And the reason for that is chaos theory is, a, is about complexity and in predictions. In fact, I was gonna call my first book uh, Chaos Theory and Your Career. And then Viking Press, who had bought the rights to it, their marketing department said, no, one physicist will buy that book and write a review on Amazon saying, you don't know a damn thing about chaos theory. And so they said, no, we can't call it that. So they're the ones who came up with you majored in what? And I am very grateful to them. Um, because, but that you majored in what really adequately captured my experiences of being a liberal arts major, and I know it was true for a lot of my students at Dickinson and Wake Forest and Vanderbilt and University of Texas at Austin, where I've run all the career centers. Um, so I'm going to explain a little bit more about chaos theory and careers. I'll try not to bore you to pieces. But um, I want to show you a slide. But the, before I do that, I, I've got a quick question. I want you to take yourself back to age 18. For some of you, that's a longer stretch than others. Um, back at age 18, curious, how many of you are doing the job you thought you would be doing? Oh, you're all accountants and lawyers, aren't you? Or, <laughs> <laughs> There's a few, and congratulations, Mazel tov to those, those of you who are, who are doing that and are, are linear and all that. And the rest of us, I, I think, have, have discovered things over the years. You know, that, but it is a pressure point. It is a question that people at age 18 get asked all the time, and it's kind of not always the most fair question to ask. But one of the things I like to do uh, when I was working a lot with liberal arts students is this is a chart I created and I updated it whether I was at Dickinson or Vanderbilt or wherever. This is actually, oh, that didn't come out very well, did it? I'm afraid that the transfer over to Google maybe messed that up a little bit, so apologies for that. Um, but this is a chart that's actually based on my Texas students and I'll, I'll sort of read it to you a little bit to make it easier. But the reason I created it was parents of liberal arts students are always worried about where their son or daughter is going to go. And I like this because it showed sort of a relationship, the linear process. So for instance, you have an ancient history civilization major who becomes a law student, you have an astronomy major who becomes an Air Force officer, econ major who becomes a bank manager, English major who's a technical writer, um, and um, you know, a, uh, one of my, my favorites was my psychology major who worked for the Humane Society. She said her job was to match people with dogs. And she used her knowledge of people to ask them what kind of dog, what breed of dog would work best for you. She always said, I don't know much about cats, so it was sort of like, here's your cat. But she said with dogs, she could kind of figure things out. And then, of course, and again, it's maybe a little hard to read in this slide, but the philosophy major was the limo driver. And I, I kind of put that in as a little bit of humor because yes, that was true as a limo driver, but it was because their parents owned a business and he was in grad school or getting into grad school and just was taking a summer off. I did learn, note to, to everyone, parents of philosophy majors don't always have a great sense of humor. So you have to be a little careful with that. But this is the real story. And it might as well just be that messy because it is that messy. The um, the, the person who was the Humane Society matching people with dogs, she was an English major. And she said she learned more about people by reading about characters in books than she ever would have learned in a psychology class. And so she's the one that was matching people to dogs. And actually, the philosophy major was the software developer, was making more money than anybody else on that page. And the chemical engineer was the student who was going to grad school and was driving a limo in the summer. Um, but it, it does, again, apologies for kind of the messiness of it, but it does show you that this whole prediction thing is a little tricky. And, and students are constantly pressured to predict what their career is going to be because of what they majored in. And, and it's just... There, you know, that, that connection does not have to be there. Sometimes it's linear and wonderful, and you pretty much want your accountant, your accountant to be an accounting major, or at least at the graduate level, I would like that. Um, but, you know, aside from certain very linear fields where you need something, you really have a lot more flexibility. Uh, but this really does illustrate kind of chaos theory at work.
And so it is all this idea of can we predict? And if anybody's ever had a hurricane coming their way, you know how predictions work when it comes to the weather. There's a little sort of pandemic joke that's been going around. You know, as career counselors, we always try to prepare people for job interviews. And one of those questions you often get is, where do you see yourself in five years? Well, anybody who answered that question in 2015 was wrong, you know? I don't think any of us saw ourselves sitting at home buying our groceries from Amazon or whatever in 2020, but that's where many, many of us were. Um, so finding ways to, you know, can we predict or how can we start thinking about our futures? How can we start to have a meaningful career and life if, if it's so hard to predict? I love this quote from the uh, writer in The American Psychologist. The presence of chaos suggests that even if we're able to characterize all the variables in a nonlinear system completely, general patterns of future behavior may be the best we can hope to predict. So it's like the weather. We're probably really good at predicting it an hour from now, maybe. A couple days from now, eh, a week from now, now we're getting to the general trends. You know, what's it usually like in June? And career planning can be very much the same way. You know, you, you may know where you're going tomorrow, but knowing where you'll be six months from now, a year from now, whatever, can be a little trickier. And that goes for retirement planning as well. You know, you might have plans right now, but as they like to say in chaos theory, things emerge. Things happen, whether they're planned or unplanned. And so, you really have to, to kind of roll with the constant change and influences that are gonna come your way. And it's really not a linear process, it's improv more than anything. It's how can I pivot today? I think of the old Friends episode, taking the sofa up the stairs, you know, how to pivot. Um, but situations that have, that seem chaotic at our level, when you get above it, and you look a little beyond it, you'll start to see patterns and there will be some meaning and structure to the whole thing. So you wanna stay detached from trying to do too much prediction, but at the same time, you wanna be open to the things that might be coming along. You've all heard of the butterfly effect and that's why I have that butterfly there. That notion that a small event, a small thing can happen and can cause a lot of change and unexpected things. And I think being open to that butterfly, uh, whether you know it's going to happen or not. One of my students back at Dick, when I was at Dickinson College got her first job by playing in a handbell choir. She was playing uh, at a Christmas concert at a small church outside of Carlisle. And at the end of the, the concert, they, she was asked to, everybody was asked to introduce themselves and being a smart, college senior. She said, my name is Jen, and I'm a Russian area studies major, and I just got back from studying abroad at the Mendeleev Institute, and I want to do something about Russia. And she sat back down. But afterwards, this woman came up to her and said, my husband is the CEO of some company that was in the Carlisle area. I think it was Carlisle Syntec at the time. And she said, uh, we're just going into the Russian, uh, we're, we're just now emerging into the Russian market, would you like to talk to him? And of course she said yes. Literally two weeks later, she was on a plane with the executives of Karlov Syntec flying over to Russia and showing them around Moscow and, and acting as a kind of an interpreter for them. That's the butterfly effect. And I cannot say, and the problem with it is I can't say to you all, just go join a handbell choir and you'll, you'll find a job. You're gonna have to find your own experience there. But that is what happens. Things emerge, the butterfly shows up and you can't predict it and it could be happening this weekend. In fact, I'm hoping there's a butterfly moment with my fellow girls of Mercersburg where we might come up with some ideas for a book or a business or some other things based on what all of us, the point in our lives that we are all at now that we would never have predicted before we got here. Um, Charles Dickens was pretty good at this as well. Uh, that, he says in Great Expectations, that was a memorable day to me, for it made great changes in me, but it's the same way with any life. Imagine one selected day struck out of it and think how different its course would have been. Pause you who read this and think for a moment of the long chain of iron or gold, of thorns or flowers, that would never have bound you, but for the formation of the first link on that one memorable day. So it's that idea of one day, some, somebody you meet, something can happen. 
like spammers can be calling you on your cell phone right now, like I just got. Something can happen that you're not expecting and it can change everything. So in terms of the market and the future, you know, all I can say is it's just going to be ongoing disruption. Anybody who tries to tell you what the market's going to be after COVID, it just is probably going to be wrong. And it's going to demand constant flexibility on your all's part to, to roll with it. Back to that improv theory. What can I do next? What might be happening? Detaching yourself from these long-term predictions. We're definitely in an idea-based innovation type economy where entrepreneurship is demanded of all workers, whether you're in an entrepreneurial field or whether you're a manager in a company. Everyone needs to be an entrepreneur. Everyone needs, I've always said, you should always act as if you're self-employed. No matter whose name happens to be on the paycheck this week, you always want to act as if you are self-employed so that you are keeping yourself up to date with what you need to do. So um, what can we predict? What can, how can we manage this? So here we go. These are the secrets that I'm not going to teach you. Um, there are, I have six ideas here that I uh, sort of arbitrarily came up with that I thought might be good for helping you all manage whatever your futures might be, knowing that I've got a wide range here of futures. And so let's take a look at, at them. The first one is building resilience. Uh, I love this quote. I love Julie Cameron and her writing, The Artist's Way. She says, it's the willingness to once again be a beginner that distinguishes a creative career. You know, that willingness to go back to the start and not be the know-it-all, not to be the, the smartest guy in the room. You know, to be willing to be open to learn something new can help you so much with resilience. And there's a little bit of a double-edged sword to resilience. I think some of us are a little tired of hearing that we need to be resilient. And I think many of us feel we've been pretty damn resilient for the last two years. And maybe are ready not to be quite so resilient. I think it's important. I don't think you have a choice because I'm not sure what the opposite is of resilient. I remember interviewing back years and years ago. I was interviewing for a department store. I was interviewing candidates for non-management jobs. And I asked one candidate, what do you do when, you know, when things get kind of crazy or the work gets really you know, piled up and all that? And he looked at me and said, well, I just fall apart. So it was not a good response. And, and, I, and I would recommend, since that might be the opposite of resilience, I think try not to, try not to do that. But um, I think with resilience, part of resilience is compassion, compassion for yourself in what you are going through and taking a break. John Kabat-Zinn, the meditation expert, said that if you're breathing, there's more right with you than wrong. And so I think some days, if all you can do is breathe, you're good. And so, and that is part of resilience. Um, but I think being compassion, having compassion for others too, and just recognizing we're all in this same boat. You know, we have all dealt with things over the past two years. We're all a little tired. We're all a little burned out. And just recognizing that and increasing your, your resilience through that. One of the best ways I find to focus on resilience is your mindsets, how you choose to interpret and manage the world. Certainly cognitive behavioral psychology has taught us that, that, that you know, how we think very much affects how we feel. But this is a, a thing I love to do with, with my students, and I have them go through an exercise where we identify these different mindsets and which ones are your strongest ones, which are, because these are your superpowers. You know, are you an analytic thinker? Are you a strategic thinker? Are you good at systems? What I, what I would do with my students is I would ask one of them, what's the worst baseball team? And I don't know, I know the Orioles aren't doing so hot this year, but you know, which is the worst baseball team? And I would say, okay, you've all gone together, you've all purchased it, how are you gonna make it better? And that requires you to be a systems thinker. You have to think about everything from the marketing and the logo and the team colors to who the manager is, to who the, uh, who the, uh, what is the relationship between the pitcher and the catcher. You know, you need all those components which you, to be able to put together a good baseball team. And a good systems thinker will do that. They will think across the system. They won't focus on just their area. They'll know that every area is important. Um, you know, an inclusive thinker, someone who recognizes diversity and recognizes that we need to find ways to include everyone in whatever process we're doing. Creative thinkers, positive thinkers. Um, collaborative and reflective and flexible and all of that. And, uh, you know, this could be like a two-hour lecture, so I will stop. But 
basically this idea of how, what are your strengths? What is your superpower? What kind of thinker are you? And how has that ability allowed you to survive and do well in whatever you're doing? And how might it take you to the next thing, whatever that might be? Carol Dweck wrote a really good book called Mindsets, and she talks about a growth mindset for, or a fixed mindset. That's another way to look at things. Okay. The second tip is to find the meaning in what you're doing. And there's a lot of ways to do this, and I'm not a, 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 I'm not a preacher. I, I can't go that route. This is an exercise, though. I call it a career diamond, and I love to do this with, with folks. And it's very simple. You draw the diamond like that, and um, the first top block is who. I use a lot of visual thinking, and this is just one of them. Who do you want to be around all day? And think about that in your job, but also in your retirement. You know, customers, clients, colleagues, who do you want to be surrounded by? I found that I really like smart people. <laughs> and I also really like college age, like that 18 to 22 age range. And so it kind of logical is that I ended up in the field that I ended up with because I was working with all the right kinds of people for me. But be thinking about what kinds of people do you want to be around all day and in your retirement. You know, do I, we were talking earlier, some people were talking about CCRCs, you know, these comprehensive retirement centers. Some have been talking about over 55 uh, housing developments or, or neighborhoods, you know, and some are in just your traditional neighborhood. What works for you? What kind of people do you want to be around all day? And then what are you doing? So whether that's in retirement or in your job or in your life, what are you doing all day? What are the, you know, are you, um, are you crunching data? Are you working with spreadsheets? Are you um, working with people? Are, and if you're working with people, how are you working with them? Are you teaching? Are you consulting? Are you uh, helping them? And if you're helping them, how are you helping them? So just make a list of the what's. And then the next is the where, which can be anything from a cubicle, which no one says, to Paris. You know, where do I want to be doing this? Am I in a hospital setting? Am I in a clinic setting? Am I in a factory setting? You know, what is the milieu that you want to be around? And being careful to find the right area that has the people that you want to be around. There can be a mismatch there. Some people aren't all that fond of their coworkers. They might like their job, but they don't really like the people they're working with. Uh, I've talked to a fair amount of lawyers who talk that way. And so you want to you know, you think about maybe I need to be at a smaller firm, private practice or something else if the, if the big practice isn't working. But then the most important question at the end, and of course you're seeing this all at once, but when I'm working with someone we do it a step at a time. And at the very end comes the why. So what's the why behind it all? Why do you like these kinds of people? Why do you like, and, and also I have animal people by the way. Some people are like, no, I'd rather just work with animals. Um, but the why is what's important about that. What's the meaning in it? What's the meaning of where you are? What's the meaning of what you are doing? And what's the meaning behind who you're working with? And just that simple breakdown, for those of you who are kind of in a thinking process right now, might help you start to organize your thoughts. Why I'm a big believer in visual thinking like this is our brains are just going a mile a minute. And if you can get it down on a piece of paper, you can make sense of it. There's another classification system that Amy Rosniewski came up with that's called job career calling. Um, and basically, she, she divides um, people's experience in their work as whether you treat it like a job, which is more of the, I'm, if this pays me what I need to earn so that I can go boating on the weekends you know, and I'm, I'm happy doing that. Career is more of the advancement approach, better title, better office, more income. Uh, can I have a certain status in the community? Um, you know, do I want to publish a lot? People know who I am. And then calling, which I suspect everybody understands um, the idea of I would do this work if I weren't even paid to do it. And the thing to keep in mind is that that does not just because you know someone's career. There are ministers. You might think they all have callings. No, there are a lot that it's a very uh, specific type of job. They like the organization. They like having a, an audience to talk to once a week. You know, there's a lot of reasons they might choose that profession. And there, uh, Rosniewski herself tells the story of a uh, hospital setting where she was doing her research on this. And um, they noticed that in one of the hospital wings where uh, there were a lot of patients who were either comatose or had been in and out a lot of... of uh, various steps of awareness. And they noticed that the paintings kept moving around. You know, the artwork kept changing and they didn't know what was going on and they finally found the janitor. 
And he said, well, you know, I see these people more than some of the doctors do. And he said, I just figure if I was there, I would not want the same painting every day. I would not want to wake up every two months and see the same painting. And he said, so I just make a point of moving them around so that my patients have something new to look at. That's a calling. So I, you know, I, it just, I think thinking about that, if anybody's interested, there's a website from the University of Pennsylvania's positive psych program called Authentic Happiness. I think it's authentichappiness.org. And um, there's a test on there that you can take to see whether you're in a job career calling area. So the third thing to do is to connect the dots in your life, to think about how the things you have done connect with other things. And I created this, this thing called a wandering map that was really just a mind map that I started doing uh, back in the 1980s with my students. So I've been doing this a long time. And basically, you put your whole life down on a piece of paper, and then you start looking for the connections and the themes. And I, I, I had read some of the creativity writings of a gentleman named Herb Simon, who received the Nobel Prize back in the 60s for the field of artificial intelligence. And he writes a lot about creativity. And he was asked, you know, how did you come up with this artificial intelligence? You know, how did you develop the part of that that you did? And he said, well, it's because I had degrees in economics, computer science, and sociology. And he said, it created a network in my mind, and he called it his network of possible wandering, the idea of where his brain could wander because of what he had done. And so we all have a network of possible wanderings, every single one of you, based on where you grew up, what your experience was here at Mercersburg, what your experience has been past that, and you can start to find the, the, the ideas and the connections and the, what I call the threads and the themes that run through your life. Um, this is another example of one of my students' wandering maps. And um, it's, it's probably a little hard to read, and, and even my, my print here is kind of uh, tiny. But basically what she did was wrote down all the things that were going on in her life, and then we started looking for themes and threads. And she discovered that she had a thread of travel, and she had a thread of communication and connecting with people. It's not going to tell her what job she should get, but it certainly is going to tell her the areas she ought to be thinking about and looking at that are probably going to give her meaning. The easiest way to do this is, you know, when someone um, does their map, I can almost guarantee they're going to put a sport down on that map that they have been part of, either a sport or an athletic thing. I'm going to pick on Rich Haskell. Rich, do you, tell me a sport that you play. Golf. Golf. Tell me what you think is the, a really important personality trait to have to be a good golfer. Patience. I love it. That's what one of my students said about tennis. Can you right offhand think of something else in your life that probably would have been on that map that required patience? Putting you on the spot, man. There you go. Raising children. Yes. And the grandchildren. There you go. That's the idea. You put, a, put your life down on a piece of paper, and then you ask yourself, what is the personality trait or skill that I needed to, to do well in that? And where else have I shown it? And that's where you'll see your thread and your themes start running through your life. Um, so, so thinking about ways to connect these dots in your life. You know, I know people who were born leaders because they were running the the uh, tag games at age four in their neighborhood, you know, or they were born writers because they started a newsletter when they were, you know, seven. Um, and so finding those threads and themes can, can definitely, first it's great for interviews because you can explain to an employer why, why if patience is important in the next job that Rich is going for, you know, he can, he can sit there and explain all the places where he's had to demonstrate patience. So, I mean, it, it just becomes a great story for you. So let me move on to the fourth thing, which is exploring the possibilities. This is what I call a possible lives map, and it's, this was created by an 18-year-old at Vanderbilt. And what I have people do, and this works at any age, is put down the jobs that sound interesting to you or that you've ever thought about. And it's okay to put marine biologist because you saw Shamu the whale when you were five. Or I have people put firefighter because when they were in kindergarten, they visited the fire 
station. But as you can see, she's got this wild crazy, and this again, get it out of your brain and onto a piece of paper. Because one of the challenges, you know, people will accuse liberal arts students of being clueless. They're not clueless. They just have 50 things they want to do, and it's hard to narrow it down. And so this gets it out of your brain, and you put it all around, all these things you've thought about, pastry chef to an FBI agent. And then on those lines, you start writing the steps to get there. And you're going to very quickly see, first of all, if you can't write any steps, it means you don't know enough, so you've got to go research it. But aside from that, you're going to see um, which things give you energy. I had a student start where she had librarian as an option, and she starts writing, you know, well, I need to go get an MLS, and I need to do this. And then she's like, this is really boring. And so she stopped writing. And the nice thing is she can now take that off her plate, and that is, is not going to be her career field. Um, so thinking about these different kind of, of possibilities, and again, if you're considering retirement, what are the possibilities? What are the places you might want to live? What are the things you might want to do? What are the hobbies you want to continue? What are the hobbies you want to start? Um, you know, so just getting this all down to help you think it through. And so some things to ask yourself about this is, what's holding me back from these possibilities? One of the most common things is age. Let me bust that right now. I had the audacity to write a book for 18-year-olds when I was like 55. You know, age really shouldn't be a consideration. You know, I get it. There are certain things that come with age. But, but really, you're never too young for the most part, and you're never too old. Uh, once again, as, you're lo as long as you're breathing, everything, there's more right than wrong. Um, I didn't even take my last job at Vanderbilt University running their career center until I was 62. And there are a lot of people that will tell you, oh, after 60, no point in interviewing a job. You're not going to get it. No, that's just not true. So what options are you considering and why? And what are you rejecting and why? why? And it's okay to cross things off your list, but why are you? Being careful that you haven't self-imposed those limitations due to myths. And I want to bust a couple of myths. I love this meme. I've always assumed ironing boards were surfboards that stopped pursuing their dreams and got a real job. Um, I always look at my, my ironing board and just go, oh, I'm really sorry. You'd love to have tie-dye colors and be out on the Pacific, wouldn't you? Um, you know, there, it's not always possible to blend the passion and the practical. You know, that, and, and sometimes you don't want to because, because you may have something you love and if, it's, if you turned it into a money-making thing, it might hurt that. But I think people sometimes put their passions in a practical box and they, they just don't realize there are ways to monetize it, there are ways to turn it into a career or a future. And so I would just encourage you not to put it in a box but to think about how could I incorporate my passion into what I'm doing. We saw a lovely program yesterday from Donna Fisher about um, just her amazing work in photojournalism and photography and all of that. And you want to talk about blending. And, and, and she was taking pictures of me very, very kindly my senior year. And, you know, I, and I still have some of those lovely pictures. And I wish you'd done my senior yearbook picture because that was awful. So, yeah, I really wish I could have hired you. Um, so the, the whole point being, you know, um, you can combine them sometimes, but you're the only one who knows that, so you want to think about that. And, and if you have a passion, what does that, go back to what I said earlier, what skills do you need to have that passion, what personality traits, and then how might that apply to this other side of your life, this more practical side? Okay, another thing is, are you stereotyping yourself? And I love this, I'm an English major, you do the math, you know? Uh, this is a fixed mindset. I'm an English major, so I can't do the math. You know, my, uh, one of my good friends is an accountant. She got her master's degree in accounting, but her undergraduate degree is in French. And she says that is absolutely the best major for an accountant. And it was because she learned to communicate. She understood people from other cultures. She, she was able to work with her clients in a way that some of the more traditional accountants did not. So you don't want to stereotype yourself. Another thing I hear from a lot of people is, well, what will people think? You know, what do people think if I leave my prestigious job or I change these, these careers? I got this degree. Don't I have to do this because of this degree? Annie Lamott, who wrote one of the best books on writing called Bird by Bird, she says, you own everything that happened to you. Tell your stories. If people wanted you to write warmly about them, they should have behaved better. Um, now, a, a quick note. Anybody thinking of writing a memoir, do check with a lawyer first. There is such a thing as slander and libel, and you need to be careful. But aside from that, um, you know, 
getting rid of that? Am I doing stuff because other people are thinking a certain way? Because truth is, other people aren't thinking about us nearly as much as we think they're thinking about us. And, and it, you might be holding yourself back for a reason that, that just isn't realistic. Okay, and I'm going to be careful with time. We've got a little bit of a late start, but I'm going to whip through this. We'll get, we'll get done. Um, the fifth thing is turning pro. Now, this is another of my favorite writers who writes about writing. Stephen Pressfield wrote the uh, screenplay for The Legend of Bagger Vance, if you ever saw that movie. Um, but he is an ex-Marine, and he writes like an ex-Marine. And, you know, he, he writes books about writing, and, and he has one called Do the Work that will just kick your butt if you, need, if you need that. But I love this. The sure sign of an amateur is he has a million plans, and they all start tomorrow. Turning pro is he, he differentiates between who is professional in whatever they're doing, even in your hobbies, versus who's an amateur. And, and he, um, I have found that that's a really good question to ask people. When I, uh, I myself turned pro as a writer in my 50s, when I finally decided to query an agent and move forward. I'd written some chapters in books, I'd written articles, but I never wrote the book that I had in my head. And the day I decided to query an agent was the day I had to turn pro, because I had to really think about that. I, I met with an, a Vanderbilt alumnus who uh, is a film, uh, documentary film producer in Hollywood, and I asked him, when did you, you know, what was your turning pro moment? And he said, well, I was putting all this stuff up on YouTube and I was doing little videos and I was doing this and that. And he said, then I entered a contest. And he said, I suddenly had to get my act together because it was a contest and I needed to make everything right. And he said, that was the day I turned pro. And so I would encourage you to think about that in whatever your, your hobbies are, whatever it is you're doing, what would a pro do? And you don't have to become a professional, but it's that idea of what would a pro do? And it's going to turn your mindset a little differently. And you're going to rethink how you might approach golf that next day. Because what would a pro do? A pro might go out and, you know, hit a bucket for an extra half hour or something. So I'm going to set a goal to do that because that's the next thing that is about turning pro, is setting goals. Planning your career and planning a book, as I said, there's a lot of writer analogies here. There's not all that much difference. And there are, in the world of writing, there are what we call planners and pantsers. Planners, James Patterson's a perfect example. James Patterson is notorious for writing treatments for his books that are longer than his books. He writes these outlines and plot analysis and character analysis and all of that before he ever starts writing the book. On the other hand, E.L. Doctorow was interviewed by um, George Plimpton one time, a long time ago, and he was asked, how well do you, you know, how do you plan your books? Do you write chapter one, chapter two, and plan it all out? And he goes, no. He said, I create the characters, and they're in my head, and I just let them talk to each other, and they tell me the story. And by the way, pantsers stands for seat of the pants. That's where that phrase comes from. But he said, the characters just tell me the story. And he has a very famous quote from that. He said, it's like driving a car at night in the fog. You can only see as far as your headlights, but you can make the whole journey that way. Now, some of you have headlights. Those 18-year-old, those folks that raise their hands, you have headlights that take you 10, 20, 30, whatever years in the future. And as I said, mazel tov, good for you. Uh, you know where you're going. Some of you have headlights that will take you to dinner tonight. And that's okay, because you'll get to dinner, and then your headlights will get you to the next stage. Um, you, you just work with what works for you. And a planning system that I have in my book, You Majored in What, deals with this. It talks about three different, and by the way, the green is Gatsby's light at the end of the dock, you know the goal. But the idea is some folks are what I call probable seekers. You're the people that all the goal setting books were written for. You know what your goal is, you know where you want to go, just got to get to the steps. Some of you are possible. You've got three, four things. That's okay. Put them all down, start pursuing each one, see which one starts to pull your energy, see which one becomes more, more reasonable to do, see where you don't encounter as many roadblocks. And then some of you really don't have an idea yet, and that's okay because that's where you just want to set an intention of, um, I had a student once who, said, who really just didn't know what she wanted to do, and she said, I just want to have an interesting job next year. 
she was a senior. She said, I just want to do something interesting. So we, we wrote it on a, you know, on a little sticky tab, look for an interesting job. She had it out there, and it was just in her mind. A few, about a week or so later, um, a friend had recommended her to Teach for America, and she got this email from Teach for America inviting her to apply. And she, sa she said, I found myself saying, well, that looks interesting. There you go. She ended up at Teach for America. And I think that, you know, being just open. So that kind of leads into my last one, and that is to try wandering if all else fails. Stop judging. Stop trying to predict what's going to work. Take the pressure off. Wander into things that look interesting. I've always written nonfiction. That's been my world. And then about four or five years ago when I moved to Nashville, I discovered this conference called Killer Nashville. And I love to read mysteries, and so I thought, well, that sounds fun. So I, I went to it, and I met just these amazing people because they were all former FBI agents, former CIA, form, you know, uh, military types, and, and then people my age, ladies who wrote what they call cozy mysteries, like Murder, She Wrote, and um, just an amazing group of people. And I suddenly started thinking, maybe, you know, I could write a mystery, and that's what I've now I'm moving over to, all because I went to Killer Nashville for a few years in a row and really learned how to write a mystery. We learned a lot about blood spatter. If anybody wants to learn about blood spatter, you certainly do learn that. Um, so that's a new world for me to wander in. But I, I, you know, be thinking again, now you've got this COVID period, you've got a chance now to wander into something else. And I think the, the reason I love that word wandering is it's not as kind of loose as it sounds. It's more like being open to an experience and trying it out. And just to quote one more famous author, you know, not all those who wander are lost. So it's really a good way to, to think about where you want to go next. So I don't know if I actually gave you secrets or not, but the idea of building your resilience and, and being compassionate, you know, finding the meaning in what you do, connecting the dots in your life, going back to things you loved. I mean, probably my interest in mysteries goes back to reading every Nancy Drew uh, and Hardy Boys book, you know, back when I was in like second or third grade. You know, um, I think that, that that's always been an intrigue. What are the possibilities? Finding those possibilities, turning pro at whatever you do. Once you've wandered in and you find something you like, turn pro. And then again, being willing to wander. I have a, a gift for you if you haven't already seen it, this picture your career. Um, that's the URL, but you know, just Google Vanderbilt University picture your career. It'll show right up. It's a free download. You don't have to give your email. No one will, will taunt you or haunt you for anything. You will not be put on a million lists. You can just click on it. It's on what's called a Creative Commons license, meaning you can download it, you can print it. The head, our head here could print a copy for every single Mercersburg student if he wants to, as long as he doesn't charge them for it, or put his, put his name over my name. He can have it. So, um, but Picture Your Career has all kinds of visual thinking exercises. I think the diamond is in there. Uh, some of the other ones are not because they're in my book. But there's all kinds of exercises in there to help just get you thinking about things. I have uh, lots of publications that, that you um, are welcome. And, and I can tell you, you majored in what, and some of the others you can find on Amazon in the used category for a dollar. So you, and your local library has them, too. I'm an I'm a awful salesperson. Um, but anyway, they're, they're certainly out there and available. Um, and I'm, I'm no longer, uh, this was my last year with the What Colors Your Parachute program. They're, they're uh, going in a different way. And so I decided this was a better time to leave them and work on some fiction and maybe in nonfiction with some of my colleagues. I also have a Psych Today blog, so feel free. I want to tell you one, one final story and then I will let you all go. But I'm, well, I'm happy to hang around if, if anybody's got questions. Um, let me tell you, when I talk about threads and themes, let me tell you a Mercersburg theme. One of my teachers at Mercersburg um, l gave me a record album, because um, that's where we were back in the 70s. It was record albums. And uh, it was an album by this guy named John Stewart. And I didn't know him, no relation to the comedian that we all know now. But he said this guy was in a, a folk group called the Kingston Trio. And he wrote this hit for the monkeys uh, called Daydream Believer. And, and he said, I think you'd like his music. So I take this album and I play it. It probably annoyed Muffy and others across the hall with it, playing it over and over. I just loved it. So after Mercersburg, I kept buying John's albums, started going to his concerts when I could find him. 
uh, actually got to know him, got to be friends with him. Uh, my ex-husband was an attorney, and, and he, uh, he helped him out with some legal issues. And so over the years, just got to know John pretty well. And um, about 20 years ago, John contacted me and said, uh, I'm starting what's called a Kingston Trio fantasy camp. If anybody knows about baseball fantasy camps down in Florida where you can go and play baseball with your favorite team, he said, well, in this case, you bring your guitar and you're going to get on stage and play with the Kingston Trio. And um, I went to it, and it's very courageous, first of all, to get on a stage in front of 400 people with a guitar when you haven't played it since, like, college. Uh, but also, it's very courageous to go to Scottsdale, Arizona in August because that's, that's a whole other story. Um, but for 20 years now, I've been going out there. Sometimes I get on stage, sometimes I don't, but, but I have been going out there and have met well, probably n at least 100 of my Facebook friends are folks from that C Scottsdale group. And it has been such an important part of my life for the last 20 years, so much fun, and just knowing every August we're gathering and we're just going to go to dinner, just like these kinds of gatherings. We're, we're just going to meet up and we're going to have lots of fun. So go back to Charles Dickens. Imagine one day in your life removed you know, if he had not given me that album. There's 20 years worth, more than that, 40 years worth of experiences I would not have had. And I suspect every person here has a Mercesburg experience like that. So I would hope that you would reflect on that while you're here. If you've got a cool story, tell it to me, because as you know, I tell stories and I will steal it. And I will, I won't, I will not say your name, but I will tell your story. Um, and. I just hope that, that what we've done here is given you some ideas, given you some thoughts about maybe some new ways to think about your career. Maybe you call your son or your daughter and give them some new ways to think about their career. But I hope this is helpful, and I thank you so much for coming. Thank you again, Kate. We sincerely appreciate your time and spending some time with us this afternoon. On behalf of the Alumni Council, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your weekend. Kate will linger around if you have any questions, and hopefully we'll see you on the dance floor this evening. Thank you.